Hi, good people. It's Amy from Savor Salvage Scent, and I hope you're doing well. Um, for those of you who are new to the channel, this focuses mostly on fragrance and some other um, creative and DIY projects. And to those of you who are returning, thanks so much for keeping the conversation going. Um, if you haven't yet, I hope you'll hit the red subscribe button so that we can stay in touch. And if you enjoy this video, um, it would mean the world to me if you'd give it a thumbs up. So. I thought it would be interesting perhaps to come to you with um, some content that has to do with the testing phase of uh, perfumery. Um, one of the things that I love about uh, experiencing or collecting fragrance um, is to me, like I would imagine in the wine world, this is how I think of it, um, even if you were a total connoisseur or a, was it sommelier? Um, you would likely never drink all the wines in the world. There's just too much. Every year there are so many releases and there are so many artists that have their um, own interpretation. And that to me is part of what's exciting. There's so much to explore. Um, and to me, uh, there was so much to explore within the classics for years and years. And now I'm getting more into independent perfumery. And yeah, the just there are so many interpretations and uh, works of art. So even if you're a collector, you don't own everything and you can't do it all overnight. <laughs> this is my slow way of getting to. Um, I am really just starting to get into Serge Luten's uh, fragrances. I have wanted to uh, since early in my kind of collecting years, but to be honest, um, some of you know I'm an arts worker and some of the costs have just been prohibitive. Um, however, uh, there are to me some that are very accessible on sale now, which so I'm, I'm starting to kind of open that door a bit more. I started to test a few fragrances this summer and just I knew I would be blown away by them. Um, so I thought I'd talk to you today about one I own and three I'm testing. Um, and open up the conversation to ask which I should purchase in the future. I have some ideas. I'll share that soon. Um, so first, for those of you who don't know, I just thought I'd give a little background that I learned about Serge Lutens. Um, this is not comprehensive. In fact, it kind of focuses on his beginnings. But I thought this was really interesting and made sense to me as I um, experienced more of his sense. So in short, um, I learned that he was born in, I think, 1942, during World War II, um, in Nazi occupation, uh, born in northern France. And um, I want to be careful how I talk about this because it could be seen as sensational. But I think, again, it really, to me, helped me kind of understand this duality in his perfumes that I experienced. Um, so he works with a nose named Christopher Sheldrake closely, um, but they are collaborators. And uh, when he was born, um, my understanding is he was born um, to a woman who had him out of, she was married, but had him with another man out of her wedlock. So um, because of the laws at the time, um, essentially it sounds like his father, did. these are his words, did not want him his grandparents, it was just seen as scandal, and mom apparently was afraid of the, the law and the trouble she would be in. And so he was essentially passed in foster care to foster care. And um, I read a quote by him, who, man, this moved me. And it's simply, solitude has hard teeth. <clears throat> so, um, it's wild to read his story. Um, part, I think, of what moves me in this is um, my mom also experienced uh, not foster care, but born into great trauma, um, poverty, abuse, etc. Um, so reading this, whew, I understand the good and the bad of it, but he... Um, had this amazing life where he kind of, he, I think he called himself like a, he started it at 14 as like a gopher is what he called himself in a salon. 
in a French salon and then um, started, I believe, to be a, um, to cut hair and, and he, in his own words, hated it. Um, but this is kind of how part of his creative life started. And my understanding is he ended up, he is the photographer, he's been many, he is many things. Um, a photographer uh, caught the attention of Vogue, I believe worked as a photographer for a while. Um, somehow made a transition into, I think, fashion makeup artistry, and I think worked with Shiseido at some point. And this is where I need to learn more about his life. I do not contend to know everything. Oh my gosh, I'm just starting to learn. But um, this partnership with Shiseido, I believe, opened doors to creating his own perfume line. And again, he now does that with um, with Christopher Sheldrake. And my understanding is, I think Shiseido bought his company. Than me, I think. Anyway, so um, I part of what has interested me about Serge Lutens from the beginning is just I had read that a lot of his scents were inspired by his travels or time in the Middle East and Africa, um, and I believe he lives in Morocco now. I've seen photos of his home, and they're incredible. Um, and so when I read about the scents in, in, a, in a time in the 2000s and 10s where everything was coming, becoming gourmand, it was really interesting to me that he, it sounded like the, the notes and the scents and the things were still very experimental, interesting. And what I had kind of read that I have come to, to learn is true <laughs> for me is that um, even the things that you might think are kind of straightforward scents, like a the orange flower scent he has, or the one that I do own that's called Datura Noir, that's a white flower scent. It's not just straightforward. It has this kind of duality. And he, um, I wrote a few things down that I thought were really interesting. Um, he said because of his kind of way of becoming, he said um, what was challenging, of course, in being in foster care and um, feeling unwanted at times, was that it enabled him to write life in ways that wasn't planned originally. So he kind of made a, a way for himself. Um, and it's interesting because um, even when he's, he's not interviewed often, but when I have read interviews about him or with him, which are rare, um, it sounds like he still feels this duality, which I understand and I think comes out of trauma sometimes or struggle. And um, I think I even read at one point that he doesn't wear his fragrances because he's just like, no, those are lives. It, it sounds like a lot of this has, in my mind, to do with his mother and um, kind of creating for this other person in him that he longs for, this duality. Um, and, uh, it's interesting because even in these straightforward seemingly sense, there are multiple personalities in them and they're so interesting and rich. And, and I think even if you don't come from great trauma, we all have, I would say certain layers or depths or, um, rarely is a thing, one thing, including a person, right? So, um, I'm going to share with you, I know that was a big lead in, a, a really, really generous subscriber of mine, Kelly, thank you. Um, I had expressed that I was interested in learning more about Serge Luton's fragrances and she sent me three that I had been wanting or interested in. So I'm going to share with you one I own today, the three I'm testing, and then I'm going to talk to you about a few that I think I'm going to look into soon. And I'm really glad, frankly, that I did not acquire these all overnight, that I'm kind of going slow with them because these scents just seem so meaningful that like they deserve time and a story and, and, um, thought. So, um, the first scent I'll talk about is the one I own, um, which is, uh, Datura Noir. And part of the reason I purchased this is because, um, I am an avid gardener and, um, one of the things I started to grow a few years ago that is kind of like to me a gothic flower because it's gorgeous, heady, beautiful night blooming flower, but also crazy toxic and like can kill or hurt a person. Like, um, I'll place a link with, uh, photos of Deterre Noir, but 
Um, the Datura plant is, uh, I believe, either in the same family or is a moonflower, but they tend to be trumpet-shaped and um, gi giant, like over a foot long, some of mine were. Um, and they have these really thorny seed pods and parts of the flower are like super, super toxic. Animals do not eat them, um, I have noticed. But the scent that they give off at night is incredible. I love, not everybody loves, night blooming flowers um, or white florals that are heady in the summer, such as tuberose, gardenia, jasmine. I live for that stuff. I think it's so beautiful. Datura is one of the heaviest to me. It is beautiful, rich, buttery, almost lactonic, gorgeous. And to me, he has captured that in a bottle. And it is, I called this, I have a review of this I'll link below, um, basically a gothic scent because you would think it's this light flower. Um, it's, it is, it is almost, and I mean this in the best of ways, there are moments I have with this where I'm like, ooh, it's almost too much. It's so good though. So, Deter Noir by Serge Lutens. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the three that I've been testing. And these, frankly, are ones I've read about and been interested in for years and years. Oh my gosh. And I was really surprised. I would say um, I'm going to compare this to some of my other favorite uh, perfume houses that none of these are bad. The three that I've tried are all, I would say, perfume masterpieces. They're incredible. And again, they have these layers and they're rich and unfolding. But um, I'm really surprised because the one I thought I would love the most, I don't. And I love the two others even more. They're all great. But I'll talk to you a little bit about them. So the first is Ombre Sultan. Um, I, y'all who watch know I'm a huge amber resin uh, musk lover love incense, love, love all of that stuff. Um, and mm, it is great y'all. Um, and this is considered, I'm sure some of you will know one of the most highly regarded amber perfumes of all times. Like it's just considered a masterpiece and it is, um, I, I do like it, but I will be honest. I have some other ambers that I like as much or more. Um, and I think for its time, this is probably super groundbreaking. I wouldn't be surprised if people have knocked this off, frankly, so that could be the thing too. Um, it's great, but I just, this is my lane and I have a ton of ambers and resins, and so um, it's great, but two others shine more for me, but let me tell you a little bit more about my um, kind of experience with this. So this was first released in 2000, um, and I get, and I get this for a few of his scents. When you first spray them, they sometimes have notes or elements that are a little pungent. And I like that. Like, it's not just this sweet linear one or two note thing. It's like there are depths and then they tend to soften. Um, but so for this to me, when I first spray it, um, in addition to amber, I get a lot of patchouli and bay leaf and even a little bit of coriander. And with that, there's this pungent kind of nature, a little bit of funkiness. Um, and then when it dries down, I get less of that and I get more amber and like a woody smell. And it's great, um, but I would say once it dries down, it does become a little more linear for me. Um, so that's Ombre Sultan in my experience so far, really cool. Um, and then the last two are the ones that just, I had no idea I would love them so much. I should have. Um, one is Shergi, and again, this is probably not a surprise. This is considered one of the best perfumes ever made as well. Um, people, I just feel like in the fragrance community talk about it all the time. Um, it's incredible. Um, but, um, I, a friend of mine purchased this recently and let me smell it. That was about six months ago, I'd say. And I loved it immediately. Um. A lot of what what puts a lot of people off from Shergi is that it is a um, it's a tobacco scent, and so people love or hate tobacco. But then, in addition, it's got like a strong kind of hay feel. I think there's even a note of hay in it. I almost like I would even be surprised if vetiver is in it because that's got like that dried grassy hay kind of quality. Um, 
Oh my God, I love this so much. It was released in 2005, Shergi. Um, this to me is so complex. You get layers in this one. Um, when you first spray it, you get a lot of tobacco. Um, and again, I get a little bit of bay and coriander, which is interesting. I, I'm not even sure if they're in there. Um, and then almost a minute two in, I get the hay. And then as it dries down, you get more honey and more powder. And it does seem to morph like it has multiple personalities. It's, um, it's shape-shifting and really beautiful. And there are moments that even smell soapy. Like, ah, it's so cool. I would say that all of his scents that I've experienced are, I think they're even marketed as unisex scents. Hooray. Um, you should wear what you like. Um, but I would say his in particular, I just feel like, gosh, it just would depend on the person wearing them. I could see a man rocking this and just, or somebody on the uh, masculine gender spectrum. Um, but I'm going to wear the heck out of this. I love this. I, I think it, yeah, I think it's just so beautiful. Um, so Cher Guy, if you like hay, you are going to love it. If you don't, you won't. So there's that. So this is one that I'm like, I think I need to get Shergi, even though my friend has it and I always feel bad when I do that. Um, and then last but not least, I think my favorite of these was Araby. And um, let me find it. Sorry. There it is. And by the way, I don't know if you could see the colors in these beautiful samples. Look, <laughs> look at that. Literally like dual tones. Um, so Araby, I should have known I would love it just based on the story of it. It's basically supposed to smell like a um, African or Middle Eastern um, market. And <laughs> one of the issues I have with modern perfumery that I might have shared before is the descriptions sometimes are frankly so much greater than they are. I mean, things that are described as a coffee scent have like the slightest in of coffee or things like I was sure that this was described as an, uh, you know, a market. And I was like, yeah, right. Like, <laughs> that's so terrible. I'm, I guess I'm a little jaded, but, um, this truly does have like all the elements, uh, that you would expect or experience. I feel like it has, uh, predominantly it has a lot of dried fruits. Um, but it also has like spices and some of them are like, this is one of those where your nose can't wrap around it quickly. And I think that's part of what's so exciting is like, they're not the same spices that everybody use in the same accord. Like it's not just like a gourmand, like sprinkling of cinnamon or nutmeg or something. It's they're rich spices again. And some of them are really to me like culinary spices. Mm. Um, and so you've got that going on, but also I, um, I don't know if it's part of like Luton's like DNA, but Again, I get like some funky grassy stuff and like, yeah, some funk. Like it almost smells like they say in the wine community, a little bit of barnyard. And I like a bit of funk in my sense. And that's going on here too. I mean, any market I've been to, I mean, even Cleveland's uh, market, rarely is it all peaches and cream and like good smells. Like there's stuff like, <laughs> there's also stuff like rotting nearby or like animal smells or, you know, whatever. And it's all uh, wound together. And and for me, that's what I get in this. And to me, it's gorgeous. Like, it, you get, like, all that does, it doesn't, to me, make create, like, a funkiness. It creates a bit of a depth. And so Araby, to me, is, like, the winner for me. It's so gorgeous. And the dried fruits that come out for me are, like, date. And even, like, I swear I smell a little fig in this. So good, you guys. Araby. So... I think that's one that I probably need to eventually buy. So I would love to hear from you um, as far as what scents you recommend um, for him. I, I will, I wrote down a few that I'm interested in. Um, one is, I love all things carnation. He does a carnation scent. Um, I forget how you say the French word for carnation. I think it's like Wale. Um, anyways, he has a fragrance um, that's carnation based. I definitely feel like I need to get the orange, the um, Fleur de Oranger. Um, there are a couple musk-based fragrances that sound really good. Um, Dame Blonde sounds good. Feminite de Bois sounds good. Um, Un Bois Vigny I know is really popular. Uh, Claire de Musk. Um, 
the, I forget the name of it, but there's a ginger perfume that sounds really, really interesting by him. There's a, uh, gosh, like Turkish delight kind of perfume. And that, some of you probably know, like his, his older bottles, I think ranged in price from like a hundred to 150. The good news for me is they're, they sometimes go on sale between like 50 and 70. But the newer jars that are like bell shaped are very expensive. I want to say between 150 and 250. So some of those, I just don't know that I'm ever going to touch. Um, and then lastly, there's a scent of his that I believe is supposed to smell a little like baked bread and licorice. So I'm like, mm, that might have to be mine too. I struggle sometimes with bready notes, but if somebody's to do it right, it's probably him. So, <laughs> and Christopher Sheldrake. So, Anyway, I would love to hear from you. What What's your one or two top favorite uh, Lutens if you wear them? Do you have your eye on any? Um, and uh, do you know his story? Is this story new to you or of interest? Anyways, um, hope you enjoyed today's video and talk soon. Cheers. Bye.